All righty. So uh, as Deborah already mentioned, my name is Stephen Rosen. Uh, I am an event spacer just like you. Uh, and I've been coming here for like eight, ten years now. I've, uh, it's, a little, it's cool. It's a little weird to be on this side of the podium. Um, but uh, I hope that I can return the favor from everything that I've learned here by teaching you guys a few things that you might not have known before. Um, so I am a wedding and portrait photographer by profession, primarily a wedding photographer. That's where I make my money. My passion is portraits. love doing portraits, but I make most of my money doing weddings. Um, my specialty is same-sex weddings. Uh, I work with everybody, but I've shot 98 so far, so I'm almost at 100. Um, I only mention this because we're not going to be really talking about this topic today, but if anybody's interested in reaching out to and working with same-sex couples, I give a great webinar on the topic. So uh, just hit me up after the talk and I can arrange that for you. It's two plus hours of really useful information. Once again, that's my information. Um, and I have cards here which you can pick up afterwards. And, and that is officially uh, the end of my shameless plug. <laughs> And now we're going to go on today's topic, which is portraits. <coughs> so I love doing portraits. I shoot all kinds of portraits. Um, I've been working on a personal project for about eight years now, photographing people at costume events, uh, vintage parties, steampunk events, and the like. But also just as part of my business, I do uh, portraits at weddings, obviously. I take pictures of brides and grooms. Uh, also, I do headshots and I do um, kids' portraits and even occasional pet portraits and family portraits. So, let's start with a real basic. What is a portrait? Today, I'm guessing there are a million duck face selfies being posted on Instagram. Uh, that makes my heart sink because, in my mind, Oops, sorry, don't want to hit my mic. In my mind, those are not portraits. Um, a portrait, for the purposes of this talk, is a considered image. So what do I mean by a considered image? A considered image is an image where posing, composition, and lighting of the subject is thought through, is considered. Today, we'll specifically be focusing on lighting, and even more specifically, we're going to be focusing on uh, ambient and continuous light. So what then is ambient light? Ambient light is existing light that we have little control over. It's the light that's coming through that back door, or that is shining from this and bouncing off my head and hitting you, right? Or the light that's coming off the monitors or whatever. Um, or when you're outside, uh, that is the sun, or a street lamp, or the light coming from a store window, stuff that we can't really change. You can't move the sun to a different location so it'll look better on your subject. You have to move your subject to look better in the sun. That's the general idea behind ambient light. Continuous light. So what is continuous light? For the purposes of this talk, continuous light is light that runs continuously. <laughs> Duh. So that means no flashes, no strobes. Continuous light is light that just runs straight through. Lights that you can control, lights that you can move back and forth, lights that you can dim. So uh, it's similar to ambient in that it's always shining, but you have some control over it. Up until recently, most of us, when you were in a dark space, depended on flash. Uh, why do people use flash? Because up until recently, cameras weren't light sense enough to work in a darker space without creating huge amounts of noise. So you had needed a fair amount of light to deal with that. Um, con continuous lights in the past were hot, really, really, really hot. If you ever see those um, uh, Hollywood glamour shots, those are all shot with hot lights. All those movie stars were like melting under those lights. They were so hot that it was difficult to find uh, uh, like umbrellas or soft boxes because they would literally burst into flame uh, because the lights were that hot. They were also huge. And bulky. Uh, have you guys ever like run across a uh, movie being filmed at night in New York? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Come, right? Yeah. And you ever see those lights that they use to light the scene? But that's what like they're big. They're huge lights. So they weren't really easy to carry around. 
flash it was much smaller and more portable, so you could carry that with you, which is one of the reasons why people would use flash. Uh, and also flashes were battery powered, uh, and uh, continuous lights up until recently anyway were uh, electric. You had to have them plugged in, so they weren't terribly portable. Uh, so what has changed? Pretty much everything in the last four, five, six years. Uh, many cameras can shoot at really high ISOs. I commonly shooting at 6400, uh, and, and I don't really have a lot of problem with noise. You can get usable images. You can shoot by candlelight these days and get a decent exposure. And continu continuous lights are now cool, cool to the touch, and you look cool when you're using them. Um, and they are portable, lightweight, easy to bring with you on a job. And they do not need uh, to be plugged in. They're battery powered, which makes them even more portable. So I use two different types of continuous lights on a regular basis. But before I go into this in any detail, go out and play with continuous light sources. A lot of times I will go to like the 99 cent store and they'll have a bin of LEDs. I just buy them, you know? It's like some of the best lights I got were like from the Christmas tree shop. So, you know, they're cheap. There are cheap LEDs out there all over the place. Buy some, play with them, see what you can come up with. You might come up with something that works as well as this. However, for me, I use the ice lights and the GL1. Now, um, the ice, I, I'm going to show you both of these a little later on in the presentation. They are an investment. I won't lie, the ice lights are going for like 550 these days. The GL1, I think, is 600. So you've got to be serious about what you're doing if you're going to invest in this stuff. But the quality of light I get from them is amazing, and I do an enormous amount of work. It's paid for itself, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so. Um, what are the advantages to continuous light? How many people remember WYSIWYG? Anybody know what WYSIWYG is? Yes, right, all right, excellent. What you see is what you get. That, in a nutshell, is the best thing about continuous light. You don't have to take test shots. You just put the light on your subject. You see exactly what you're shooting. For me, it opens up a world of possibilities. I work way faster when I'm using continuous lights. I can experiment. I can move the light here or here or get it just where I want. I don't have to take a shot with my flash and see if it's in the right place and then adjust the flash and see if it's in the right place. Uh, so I get a lot more done a lot faster when I'm using continuous lights. So if you want to learn about using ambient and continuous light, you should turn to the people who have the most experience using ambient and continuous light. And who has the most experience? Painters have the most experience. Uh, this um, uh, is one of the earliest cave paintings I could find. It's from Australia. It's from about 17,000 years. Some people say 17,000, but some people say 70,000 years old. Contrast that with the first photographic portrait, which was, God help us, a selfie. <laughs> and it was taken by Robert Cornelius in 1839. So. Why painters? Uh, because they've been at it about 70,000 years longer than photographers. So there's a lot more that we can learn from them. If you want to learn about ambient and continuous light, see what artists did when the only light sources they had available to them were sun and fire. And that was it. So most portrait painters, unlike landscape painters, worked in studio. And uh, they all used a variation of one of the most beautiful kinds of light any of us can use, and that is window light. Uh, window light is obviously light that comes from a window. <clears throat> Straightforward enough. So remember when I said you couldn't move the sun? Well, technically true, but you can direct the sun. And the windows are the best way that you can do that. It's popular for portraits because it's directional. That is, the light comes from only one side. You can create light and shadow on your model. Uh, and depending on the size and location and distance from the subject, you can create all sorts of effects using window light. Window light has been the go-to light for portrait photographers for as long as there have been windows. And probably even back when there were caves. <laughs> they should, maybe they like, uh, uh, chipped a hole and made their own little window to, to get some light to come through. So let's start with Rembrandt lighting, since that's who this talk is named after. Um, Rembrandt is famous for his lighting. In fact, his lighting is actually called 
Rembrandt lighting. I bet a bunch of you have already heard of the term Rembrandt lighting, right? All right, so in Rembrandt lighting, the main light is coming from above and to the side of the face. The goal is to create this little triangle of light on the cheek. That's, that, is the, that is Rembrandt lighting, light on one side and a little bit of light on the cheek. And you can tell where the light is coming from by looking at the catch lights in the eyes. Does everybody know what a catch light is? Right, so catch lights are that little white light in the eye. You can see that it's coming from above and to the side by looking at the catch lights in the eye. So this is like a perfect example. This is a picture, a self-portrait, by the way, of Rembrandt. So this, I, when I was researching this talk, I came across this uh, Rembrandt painting, which is really <coughs> awesome. So this is the studio from the vantage point of the model. Right? So I want you to pay attention to the light in this picture. Um, I want you to look at the shadow being cast by the easel, because that'll give you an indication of where the light is coming from. Now, you are the model in this, so I want you to think about, by, by looking at where the shadow is, where is the light going to be hitting you in the face? Right? You are, right now, experiencing what it's like to have Rembrandt lighting on your face. Because the light is coming from above to the side, it's going to be hitting you right here. And you're going to have that nice little triangle. And so if Rembrandt was there, you would have a fabulous portrait. Again, let's pretend this was the person who was the model. Look at the catch lights in the eyes. Lights come from above and to the side of the face. You get that little triangle of light on the side. And that's how you get Rembrandt light. So this is one of my pieces, a recent portrait that I did. And I walked into this gentleman's kitchen, and I saw that he had a window. It was late in the day, so the light was coming direct, you know, light was low, coming directly in through the window. And it was a very old Victorian house. It was a small window up. And I saw that window, and I immediately thought, I can do Rembrandt light with this. So I sat him down so he was a little lower than the table, or rather lower than the window, and I had him turn a little bit to the light, and I've got my nice little Rembrandt triangle. And uh, you can also see from the catch lights in his eyes where the light is coming from. Now this shot here, this is actually not a window. This is a door. But what happened was it was late in the afternoon. The sun was low, about up here, not all the way down, but up here. So the sun was essentially where the window would be if you were trying to create Rembrandt light. Again, you can see the catch light in her eyes. You can see the light coming in from the side, upper side. So even with the door, you can manage it. But, but don't forget, both of these images had to be shot at a specific time of day. As I said, you can't move the sun. You have to wait till the sun gets into the place that you need it to be to take the picture. On the other hand, if you're working with uh, continuous light sources, or in this case, actually, this is an ambient light source inside. This was shot in uh, a dressing room with, uh, by a bare bulb over the overhead. The, the room, it was very stark, actually. The room just had one bare bulb overhead. But I wanted to get a portrait. It was a quick little portrait. And I just moved him, again, thinking of Rembrandt. I moved him so the light was above over to the side so I could get my Rembrandt lighting on him. Again, you can always look for the catch lights to see where the light is. So if you start to go to interior spaces, you start to notice uh, where the light is falling. Um, and you can find all sorts of interesting uh, ways of getting your lighting. This, for instance, is the coat check. She's standing next to the coat check at a club. Always look for places where people are working. I work at a lot of nightclubs, so a lot of really dark spaces. Uh, I always look for where people are working, because where people are working is where there's going to be light. So coat checks are awesome. Uh, this shot was crazy. It was this club had black floors, black ceilings, and black walls. It was a tunnel. It was, it was a cave. It was like the darkest place I think I had ever been. But I went over to uh, the bar where people were working, and there was a wall sconce. And there were a couple of lights on a wall sconce. And I put the model right next to the wall sconce. And the really good thing about a wall sconce is that, unlike a ceiling light, which is way up here, a wall sconce is where the window would be, right? So you can get that same level of light coming in on your subject. So I know wall sconces aren't all over the place, but when you find one, go for it. 
Now, if you're using continuous lights, these are the ice lights. We're going to show you these in a second. Uh, the ice light is built as portable window light. It's really pretty easy to create your own uh, variation on Rembrandt lighting when you're using uh, continuous light sources. Uh, since you have seen where the light is supposed to be, through the window, above, slightly in front, over to the side, you just hold your light in the same place and voila, you have your own, um, your own window light. Rembrandt would have loved this. <laughs> This, this shot has two ice lights, so I'm using one ice light to create the um, very classic uh, um, Rembrandt light on the face. Can anybody, uh, anybody want to hazard a guess as to where the second ice light is? Uh, I think you're all saying the same thing, right? Yeah. Behind him, right? Good job. So yeah, what I was going, he's holding it like this. Uh, so what I was going for in this shot was to have uh, a dark light, dark light pattern. So we have dark on the wall, light on the face, dark on the face, light on the wall. Um, and, and that way there's contrast on both sides of the face against the background. This shot was taken uh, with the GL1, which is uh, this light over here. GL1 gives you a much broader and softer light source, so it's particularly good for um, big spaces, covers a lot more space, covers a lot more um, environment. Um, so rather than showing you these pictures, I thought maybe I could bring in a couple of volunteers and we can actually do some Rembrandt lighting on you guys. Nate? That's good. All right, ice light. Very, very super duper simple. You turn it on, you adjust the light here, can get lighter, you can get darker. And that is it. That's all there is to an ice light. Okay, so, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Isabel. Isabel, all right, Isabel, can you stand right in the middle here? Okay, so, you kind of almost have it exactly. Come forward a little bit, a little back. There it is. See how easy that was, everybody? <laughs> it took a second, and there you have uh, to, you know, Rembrandt lighting. Now the thing with the ice light is it has to be relatively close to the model to work. Uh, the other thing about the ice light is the ice lights are um, daylight balanced. So uh, it, it looks like, it really does look like window light. Now the GL1, much broader, sorry, don't mean to hurt anybody. Uh, Nate, can you go further back, back there? Now, here, the way this works is press in the, this is like a drill. Okay. So the more you press, the brighter it gets. Hold it up there, hold it down like the Statue of Liberty. So I have to come over to this side to see. All right, uh, Isabel, take one step back, please. All right, and then Nate, come in and higher and closer to me. We're almost there, almost there. Come in a little closer to her. A little less light, there you go, a little higher, I think. And there you go, there's your, uh, there it is again, there's your triangle <coughs> right here. Let's turn your head a little bit to the light. Uh, <laughs> I know you're not supposed to touch the models, but I'm always touching my models. Uh, so, so sue me, probably one day somebody will. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, there you have Rembrandt light using the GL1. Um, this shot, the GL1 was like a good 15 feet away. Um, and we had it on one of the, well, I'll show you a little later, some, one of the tricks you can use with the GL1 that's kind of cool. All right, guys, thank you very much. All righty, so that's Rembrandt light for you. Now we're going to move on to somebody who does something completely different with light. And that's Edward Hopper. How many people, how many of you guys know Edward Hopper? Yay! All right, Edward Hopper is awesome. Edward Hopper is known for really bright, harsh light coming in on his subjects. Um, really hard edges, bright highlights, long, dark shadows. Not always the most uh, flattering lighting, but super duper dramatic. So when I'm trying to, when I'm thinking of Edward Hopper, uh, you need a, a big, bright, sunny day and a big window, and you need the, the light, a, cl a cloudless day, really, 
Hopper is, is uh, just direct on sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, shooting through a window directly onto the subject um, it can create some really seriously dramatic light. Um, and later in the day, when the sun is low. Uh, this first shot is, is very Hopper. You know, the, the light is really, you can even see the uh, part of the window which had that bar across the top is casting that hard shadow on her shoulder. Uh, but it, it creates a, a really, I don't do it a lot for brides because it's harsh, uh, but it can create these really wonderful dramatic um, pro uh, profiles in particular. This shot over here, not quite so Hopper-esque. It's Hopper-esque in the, in the time period and everything. And it is a window, and it is late in the day. And you can see a little bit of the hard shadow coming in from the window over there. But it's, it's softer than what Hopper would normally be. But it gives you a general idea. Um, so that is how I utilize Hopper light when I'm dealing with the sun. But if you're trying to create Hopper at night using ambient light, uh, don't despair, because many of Hopper's best paintings are lit by artificial light. Uh, this is probably his most famous painting. This is Nighthawks. And as you can see, this is lit totally by the overhead lights in the diner, Phillies, as it's called. Um, and you can tell, I mean, you know, this is the, the light under his hat, the shadow under his hat, the shadow under her eyes. Everything is harsh, 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 bright, bright, bright. You can utilize that same approach, uh, especially in sort of darker locations like this. Uh, and again, this one was shot with the GL1. Uh, and I'm going to show you a slight variation on what I just did so you can get this kind of light. And this is, this is the vintage train. Has anybody ever gone on the vintage train? Two people. I love the vintage train. Transit Authority runs old subway cars. It's called the Nostalgia Ride. Um, and um, people show up dressed up in the period. And so I grab people who like, look awesome, and I take portraits of them. And this shot is uh, done with the ice light, actually. Uh, but I saw this woman, and I immediately thought Hopper. There was something melancholy about her, and the cloche hat and everything just looked straight out of a Hopper painting. So I lit with Hopper in mind. Uh, so. Another demonstration. New people. Let's get some new people up here. Why don't you come up? You can be my model. And the gentleman here with the glasses, you're tall. You can be my voice-activated light stand. <laughs> All righty. So these are barn doors. Does everybody know what barn doors are in general? So this is an attachment you can get for your ice light. And the purpose of the barn door is to keep light away from parts and focus it on other parts. I use it mostly to get rid of the background, so the background goes dark. All right, so Mike, okay. hold the light right here. We don't want any light to come in on the background. For the back here, can you please turn your head towards the light? A little more this way. Oops, sorry, chin down. Further back, further back, there it is. All right, again, simple enough. You can see how it, see how it matches the image above. So it's, get a little bit closer, Mike, with the light, yeah? Uh, so um, it's very, very bright so on one side as if sunlight was pouring in through a window or she was standing next to a lamp, which essentially she is because uh, Hopper used lamps as his light source. Now, if we're going to do the GL1, we're done with this. Thank you. Now, the GL1, one of the cool things about the GL1 is it has a Fresnel. So a Fresnel lens is going to make this a much tighter beam. So you can shoot a huge area, or you can go into a spotlight. This is very like theater lighting, basically. So. Mike, go back there. Hold it up high. Point it down. Press a little bit. There you go. That's very bright. I know. It hurts. Okay. <laughs> but we're going for really, really harsh lighting here. So that's kind of the idea. Now let's go in. Bring that down for a sec. Sorry. 
go in for really tight. This is the lighting that I use for the image in the train. Um, I was actually a little bit further over to the side. Actually, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Roberta. Roberta. Could you step forward a little bit? All right, now turn your head to the light. And Mike, hold her up, hold the light up, and then move back towards, put it in your other hand. There we go. That's even a little bit uh, Rembrandt-y, isn't it? <laughs> but way, way harsher than Rembrandt would have. Even Rembrandt would use pretty harsh lighting. So anyway, so you can use the Fresnel. Thank you very much, Mike. Mm -hmm. You can use the Fresnel to direct the light when you're working with uh, the GL1. All right, so we're going to move on now to Vermeer. It's one of my favorites. Ooh, I heard oohs from the audience, oohs and ahs. So Vermeer painted all of his paintings in the same two rooms at his house in Delft. Um, you see the same windows over and over and over again. And uh, they were small rooms, so the light would flood into the room. And they had white walls, so the light would bounce back off the walls back into the uh, scene. For me, Vermeer light is very much like Rembrandt light, only with fill. Uh, so how many people here are familiar with uh, the concept of fill light? Good, 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 good. OK, awesome. Uh, so um, for those of you who don't know what fill light is, let me, oh god, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Let me fill you in. <laughs> I just thought of that off the top of my head. I can't believe I didn't put it into my notes. Uh, so you have a main light, and then you have a fill light. The main light is the window light, all right? So that's that edge light that's going on along the edge of the uh, main subject here. The fill light is light that is used to fill in the darker areas that would otherwise be in shadow. So in Rembrandt, there, the light would come in, and everything else would go relatively dark. But Vermeer liked to have fill. Um, and I use this particular painting, which is called The Geographer, uh, because you can see where the fill light is coming from. Can anybody tell? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah. What, what, what? The face there on the table. That's the, for the new person who just walked in got it right. It's, it's bouncing from the sun onto the map, the paper down there, and back up onto his face. Right? Yep. So that brings me to one of the cheapest and best and useful light shaping tools out there, which is a 5-in-1 reflector, which I have a couple of them right here. How many people here use 5-in-1s? Get a 5-in-1. It's like 20 bucks. You know, it's, they're really super cheap, and there's a lot you can do with them, OK? So uh, we don't really have bright light pouring through the windows. So I'm going to try a little demo on this. But it works way better with the sunlight than it's going to with the lights. But we can, we can get a general idea of what we're working with here. So let's see. Who do we want? Alan. I don't want to get paid for this. You're not getting paid for this. You're going to come up, and you're going to be my voice-activated light stand. Who wants to be my model? Do I have any volunteers, or am I going to have to volunteer somebody? You're my model? OK. All right, so we don't have sunlight. To, oh, sorry. We're going to need to, to come. No, we want you out of the way of this screen here. There you go. So there's not a light hitting you right in the forehead. Um, so we don't have the sun coming in through a giant window. We don't have anything that intense. So I can't really replicate the geographer, which is bouncing down from below, but we can do something side to side. Uh, so let's see. Let's start with the ice light. All right, so this is a five. Whoa, this five in one here. The reason it's called the five in one you have a white, a silver, a white, a black, a gold, and a translucent. Right? They all serve different purposes. Uh, we're going to work with the silver here. I don't, uh, generally, the gold I don't use unless I'm working with darker skinned people, because the gold really looks good on their skin tone. Silver I generally use with uh, lighter skinned people, and the white I use with lighter skinned people. And the translucent, the translucent is when it's like super, super, super sunny, and there are no clouds, and the sun is directly overhead. And you need to uh, you need a scrim for the light. So you put it over the person's head like this, so that the light from the sun is softened up. It's sort of like a soft box for the sun. So anyway, uh, what's your name? Daniel. 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 OK, again, don't stand in front of here. We don't want that on you. 
And Alan, can you move the light face forward, please? Daniel, face forward. There you go. All right, so we're going to have here. There you go. This is really, again, super simple, super simple. But this is what Vermeer did all the time. You have no light, keep looking forward. You have light, let there be light, right? So in the geographer, it was actually using a piece of paper. But most of the time with Vermeer, it was actually the back wall. The, the sun was pouring in and then bouncing off the back wall and bouncing back onto his subjects. Otherwise, he would have had a black wall back there. All right, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Alan. So five and one, get one. I don't get commission, by the way. <laughs> just, just get it. So this may look nothing at all like a Vermeer, but it's using the same principle. Uh, these guys, who are just like the cutest couple ever, aren't they? I mean, it's like they're from a Pepsodent commercial. <laughs> I mean, they're just adorable. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that's, that's Kate and David. Uh, you can tell it was a bright, sunny day. You can tell where the sun is. The sun is directly behind them because you can see the edge light coming around, right? So you need to light their faces. If you were to shoot directly into the sun like this, they would be like black. They would just be silhouettes with white lights around them. All of the light that's coming from this is coming from a reflector. All right, so you can, it's amazing how much you can achieve with a reflector. Uh, and I just, when I was looking through all the Vermeer stuff, I began to realize that he was like the inventor of the reflector for all intents and purposes. Uh, so we're going to go on to Vermeer's most famous painter, uh, painting, rather, Girl with Pearl Earring, one of my favorites. Uh, you can tell again the light is coming from above and the side, very much like Rembrandt would be. Although in this case, the face is turned more to the sun, so you don't get that triangle of light. There's more light hitting the sun. But again, look at the catch lights. You can see where the light is coming from, where, this, where the window is in this case, right? Um, and you can also tell, unlike um, uh, Rembrandt, uh, there is light in the shadows. So again, stuff is bouncing off. So when I really started thinking about this picture and how it was painted, I realized that chances are there was not a black background there. It's really hard to create a black background when you have this much light pouring in on a subject. That's one of the advantages to being a painter. <laughs> no black background? Eh, no problem. I'll put in a black background. However, when you're working with the ice lights and uh, the GL1s and stuff, you can create something very similar. So in this case, I am not using a reflector. I am using uh, ambient light that was already in the room. But it's a very similar pose to this. The light is coming in from the ice light, just, just out of frame. And she's standing by a lamp. And so you can see this, it's warmer light coming in on the back. That's from the lamp light. Um, now, I could have added a gel to the ice light. It's very easy to just throw on a gel and warm the ice light up so it would be the same temperature as the, the incandescent lamp light that's, that's lighting the back. But personally, I kind of like the fact that the back is a little warmer and the front is a little cooler. It's a personal choice, but, but you definitely can add gels if you want to go in that direction. So one, one of the big advantages continuous is you can mix it with the ambient when you're in a room. You can sort of get an idea of how bright the ambient light is. Like the light that's coming from the back door is not very bright. But you could lower the, the light from your ice light to match the level of light coming in there. And you could create a nice portrait using that light. All right, so Norman Rockwell. So I want to talk about edge lighting. Edge lighting is one of my very favorite types of lighting. And I searched, and I searched, and I searched. And it was really hard for me to find a painter who used edge lighting on a regular basis. Um, it shows up a little bit in, in Vermeer, a little bit in Caravaggio here and there. But on a regular basis, it wasn't until I stumbled across Norman Rockwell. And it's like, dear god, he uses it all the time. So we all know this painting, right? It's called Freedom from Want. Um, and I want you guys to notice the lighting scheme. Uh, this is a backlit portrait. This is not something that shows up in painting. Because in order to paint something like this, you'd have to stare into the sun. So I think 
that's my own theory, anyway, that it would be really, really difficult to paint something like this. Uh, it would just be to too tiring for the painter. Uh, but Norman Rockwell did it, and I'll tell you why in a second. But before we go there, I want you to notice the edge lighting around all of their faces, all of their heads. Because the light is coming in from the window, and they're over to the sides, you get this great edge lighting that separates them all out from the background. Even the turkey. Even the turkey has like glamour lighting on it. So it's, 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 it's an awesome, awesome picture. So the thing is that Rockwell worked from photographs. That's the key. So um, <clears throat> you can see in this, uh, the photographs, he would, uh, he would hire photographers and he would art direct his models and get all the props and set everything up. Uh, and then he would uh, paint from the photographs. So that was, that was Norman Rockwell's workflow. Uh, and you can see the uh, edge light coming in uh, on this guy with the cigarette in the middle. He doesn't have the cigarette in the photograph. Um, edge light is something that we capture photographically all the time. It rarely shows up in paintings. Uh, but it did show up in Norman Rockwell, and I, I, that, this is the key to why. And this particular image really explains how edge lighting works. This is such a crazy, complicated image. Uh, and the fact that it's a coherent image is a real testament to the genius of Norman Rockwell. Uh, there's so much happening here, and yet you know exactly where you're supposed to look. And one of the reasons is that the edge lighting around all these characters pulls them out from the background. So I want you guys first to take your attention to the kid in the back with the R on his sweater. right? He's standing between two windows. And so look at the beautiful light that is encircling his head. All right, so in order to get that kind of light, you look for a window, or two windows in this case, and if you put somebody between it, the light is going to filter in from the sides and wrap around the person's face. Uh, and then you can tell how that is separating him from the really busy background. Uh, now look at the soldier, who's the sort of the guy holding the flag. In his case, uh, same windows, but they're over to the right and above. So it's all about his profile. And his profile is, is in front of a darker background with a light edge, and that separates him out. So I tend to use this technique a lot in my photography. Now, my stuff is not Norman Rockwell. I was like, when, I was, when I was setting up this talk, I was like, Jesus, I'm like comparing myself to Vermeer. This is setting myself up in the worst possible way. <laughs> but this is so, no, I'm not saying I'm anywhere near as good as Rockwell, but this gives you the idea of the edge light. I'm using the same techniques. Maybe one day I'll get as good as Rockwell. Um, so I noticed that you had the big window and, and you had the curtain, and she was in front of the curtain, so I was getting a little bit of edge light happening. But I waited for the uh, hairstylist to come around to the side to give that dark background. I, w I, I was lying in wait. I was literally like, all right, move. You're gonna, I, I feel it, you're going to move. And she did, and I got this shot with this perfect edge light. And then when I noticed how beautiful the edge light was, I took the uh, bride over to the other side of the window. And I created this using totally natural light. Edge light from the window is, is hitting her profile on the sides. And, and you see that edge light on the back arm? That is the window light reflected in a mirror behind her. I didn't even notice that until after I looked at the picture. It was just an extra added bonus. But it's great because it's against this dark area and it really makes the arm pop out. So that's a lovely picture. I'm very happy with that one. Now here's another example. These are two grooms about to get married. They were uh, adjusting each other's ties. So they were doing this. This is something you know. people ask me all the time uh, with, when I'm talking to new clients for weddings whether I pose people. Um, and um, I move people. I, I let them do their thing, but I move them to where the light is better. So they were doing this, and I was like, super cute guys, can you do that over here? So I got the window light on you, and then I moved myself so that I could have this split in half. So I would get the, the silhouette profile of the taller groom, but Keith, the shorter groom, is he's gonna, when he sees this, he's going to be really mad. I called him the shorter groom. Anyway, uh, Keith is the subject of this uh, picture uh, by design, because I have the window light coming in and forming this beautiful edge light around his face. 
And, and also, interestingly, you can see their reflections in the back. So you can see how terrible the picture would have been if I had taken a different angle, right? <laughs> I mean, the lighting is not great on them in the mirror, but it's like perfect. Well, I won't say perfect. That's blowing my own horn. But it's good in this particular case. All right, one more edge light, because I really like edge light, and then we'll move on. Uh, so this is a, what I call a portico shot. Uh, a portico is if you have a building, right, and, and you have the wall, the side of the building, outside side of the building, and then you have an overhang, and then you have a bunch of columns. So that's a portico, right? So in this case, uh, Stephen Marsh, he's uh, my model here, is standing in front of one of the columns, like right back up against the wall, and I'm letting the light from the outside filter in along the sides. So this, this is our first shot of the presentation that was shot outside. Yay, outside light, yay. Uh, and then you get this gorgeous, gorgeous edge lighting. So I just got in tight so that I didn't have light coming in from the sides uh, of my camera, you know, which was sort of uh, ruined the effect. And I was able to get this. This is, you know, like two seconds later. Uh, so this edge, I love this edge lighting. I love this. This is on Governor's Island, but I'm not going to tell you where because I don't want you to steal my spot. <laughs> uh, but I do really, really love this edge lighting. Uh, let me also point out um, there's a little bit of a reflector thing going on here on his nose. If you see the light under the nose, that's coming from his shirt. So those are the sorts of things that you need to sort of pay attention to. And the more you do this stuff, the more tuned you become to seeing it. And then you can use it to your advantage. All right, so as I said, this is the first shot uh, that we did, uh, the first shot that I'm showing you that's outside, which is very exciting. Uh, painters, for many, many years, only did portraits in studio because you needed control of the light. And portraits usually took days to do. And you needed like a consistency of light. So people generally used window light. That was the primary source. That was until the Impressionists. And the Impressionists came along, and they did quick studies outside. Uh, and they tried to give an impression of the light of the scene, hence the term Impressionists. Uh, and they loved to work outside. And they called it en plein air. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about shooting outside and trying to use the outside light to your advantage. Backlighting. So this shot is backlit. It's not a shot. This painting is backlit. Uh, you can tell. You see the shadow coming down here. So you know that it's coming behind. And there are beautiful edge lights around the, the dress on the top of his hat, on the parasol edges, on her, uh, I don't know, netting veil or whatever. One day I'm going to get somebody to wear a veil and let it blow in the wind. That's going to be awesome outside. This is the closest I've gotten to that, though. All right, so backlighting is terrific. It's, it's pretty easy to do. You need a bright, sunny day. This is not something that you can easily do with continuous lights, unless you have a really big continuous light, like they have in the movies. But the handheld and you know these, these are too small. You're not going to be able to use this. You need a sun for this, right? Uh, so uh, find yourself um, late in the afternoon or mid-morning. You don't want the sun like just coming up, but a little bit up in the sky. Uh, try to find a cloudless day or when the sun is between the clouds, so it's a really direct light. But you don't want to put your uh, subject in front of the sky. So you need to find a place with uh, trees or something in the background, but the sun is still filtering through so that you can get the bright light against the dark background. Now, similar to that shot that I showed you before of the couple, um, if I didn't have any kind of light shining on her, she would be completely in silhouette. And all, we, all you would be seeing is like the veil and the hair lights and all of that sort of stuff. So in this case, again, this is a reflector. I have an assistant over the side holding up a, gig a gigundo reflector in this case because it's for a full body. Uh, and it did a, a beautiful job of the reflecting the sunlight back into the model. Um, so. Not that difficult to do. Again, the same concept. You are controlled by the sun. You have to go where the sun tells you to go. You can't, unfortunately, move the sun uh, unless you're, I think there's an X-man who can do that. But that's about it. So use your five and ones for this. Here's another shot of a bride, but exactly the same setup. You can even see where the sun is in this case. 
Uh, so you have this beautiful backlighting coming through. You have, uh, in, in this case, it's not the veil, but the dress. That's, uh, you have this really diaphanous fabric with the dress. And so uh, you can see her legs, not, I mean, it's not legs, luckily. That would be a little weird. But you, you have this beautiful glow around the, the tube of her dress underneath the, the uh, train. Um, and it's reflected back in completely with the reflector. So when you don't have direct sun, everybody knows this painting, right? Yeah, yeah this is Georges Seurat. Right, Sunday, or Sunday afternoon on Le Grand Jatte. Uh, the Grand the inspiration for my favorite musical of all time, Sunday in the Park with George. I say, so I wanted to show you this picture. Because this is a perfect example of open shade. Uh, open shade uh, is when you're outside, and you're in the shade. So you're under a tree, or you're under a gazebo, or a, a building is casting a light, or whatever. But it's not inside a room, right? So you're outside, but you're in the shade. So if you look at this painting, you'll see that the figures in, under the tree in the shade are not casting shadows, whereas all the figures in the back are casting shadows. If you, were, if you could see their faces, which you barely can, uh, but you know the figures under uh, the shade uh, have no harsh light, no harsh shadows. It's, it's very soft lighting. Whereas if you were to look, you can't. They're too far back there, and they're just polka dots. So you can't really see actual faces. But trust me, those people have harsh light on them. They're, they're not going to photograph really well. It's the people in the shade who are going to photograph well. Um, so. Let's look at a couple of pictures that I took in open shade so you can get an idea of how to work it. Um, this is on a porch. Bright, bright, sunny day. The first picture uh, is deep into the porch. So there's almost, I mean, the light is pouring in through the sunlight from, from the outside, uh, but it's really covered. And you'll see there is almost no contrast in that picture. Um, in fact, there's really like no contrast at all in that picture. Then I move the same model three feet closer to the sun. So in this picture here, she's right where, if you were to see the sun, the, sun, uh, the, the line of the sun and shade is like right here, right? So she's right next to where the sun is just starting to come in. So you get more directional light. It's still soft. It's not harsh. It's not Edward Hopper lighting. It's not like hard lines. It's still soft lines. But you still get the shade under the nose, the shade under the chin. And in this particular case, the reason I moved her there was to get that great pattern going on from her hat, because I thought that it was really good at highlighting those ridiculously blue eyes of hers. So just three feet difference here to get that difference in light. Now this shot is taken on the same porch, only I am now where the model that we just saw was, in the corner. All right. In, in the previous shot, I was here. So we're swapping positions. And it's a different time of day. Again, the time of day in the sun dictates where you put your model when you're dealing with ambient light. So the sun is actually on the other side of the building at this point. So it's very, very soft lighting coming in from all sides. She's in a totally open place, but she's still under the porch light. You can see where the sun is. If you look at the arm on the right side, you see a little bit of an edge on the dress and on the arm. That's the main light source, which is way over on the other side of the building. So she's like in, in total shade. It's, it's relatively flat light, but because it's a much more open area and not brick all around, there's a lot more light filtering through. It's, it reminds me very much of uh, an Impressionist painting, this one. Another option are underpasses and tunnels. There are a lot of underpasses and tunnels in New York City. Uh, not the ones you're thinking of, you know, where trolls live and stuff. Uh, but um, go to Central Park, go to any park in the city, and there are bridges. And those bridges all have underpasses uh, or tunnels if they're a really wide bridge. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to take pictures. Um, if you can get your model out to the outside edge and let the light filter in from the side, you get stunningly beautiful directional light. So this is just natural light. It's just uh, it's on Governor's Island, and it's like a big tunnel, and uh, he's standing near the opening to the tunnel, so the light is pouring in from the side. You just turn your head to the light, 
Personally, I like to turn people's heads to the light. There are some people who like backs of heads for some reason and like to have the face in, in shadow. Go for it. I like to see people's faces. This is another shot. Same place, different side. Uh, as the sun moves, sun's moving this way. Half of the day, there's bright sunlight coming down on one side. Sun moves this way. Half of the day, there's bright sunlight coming down on the other side. So you have to switch sides of the tunnel to get the same general idea. But exactly the same lighting setup. It's completely natural light. I didn't do anything, not even a reflector. It is just the, the light pouring in through the side. Uh, now, another approach I take when I am not in a park uh, is uh, indented doorways, or what I call the teeny tiny, really narrow portrait studio. They're all over the city. This is the way this works. Um, in big cities, like New York, uh, there are tall, big buildings, and they almost always have these indented doorways. Um, some of the indented doorways are, uh, the bigger the building, the more indented the doorway tends to be. This one, I just shot this on Sunday, just for this class, right? So this is the first one I could find. Not ideal, but not bad. Uh, so you have these walls on the side of the doors, and they're usually pretty boring. They're usually stucco or marble or, you know, nothing too decorative, which is great because you don't want a really decorative background for your portraits. At least I don't. I like a simple background for my portraits. So you put your model in on one side, you go over to the other side, and this is what you get. You get beautiful, soft sunlight pouring in from the street side, and you get a nice, graduated, soft um, uh, shadow on the door side. Uh, and it depends, again, on the time of day. Um, you know, the sun's going to be sh shifting back and forth. You might get brighter light. You might get really flat light. But in general, I find it works really well. And they're all over the place. Find your favorite indented doorway. Don't do it during rush hour. That doesn't work. <laughs> People running in and out of the doors. Find like a Sunday is a good day to do this. And if it's really super flat, use your ice light or use your GL1. This is an ice light. I wanted a little pop. So I have the nice plain background. There actually was some light coming in on the side and some shadow, but I wanted to accentuate that. And the ice lights are not bright enough to overpower the sun, but when you're in open shade, they can add a really nice uh, contrast to your portraits. So it, it's worth keeping. I always carry mine around with me. You never know when it's going to come in handy. Um, all right. so. Uh, we can't really talk about lighting and portrait without talking about chiaroscuro. How many people know chiaroscuro? A few, a few. All right, some people have their art history. All right, awesome. So chiaroscuro is really a simple concept. It's just it's it's defined as a strong contrast between light and dark, uh, and uh, it's, it's used by a lot of different painters. Uh, but uh, the a painter most associated with it is Caravaggio. And this is a painting by Caravaggio, and this is a prime example of chiaroscuro. Um, Caravaggio's paintings always look to me like they're taking place on stage. It's, it's very, very theatrical lighting, right? And in this case, there are two light sources. There's this light source way up in the corner that's hitting the wall. Um, and it's really interesting because the only point of that light seems to be the, to add some light to the wall so that the people aren't directly against black light. Uh, because the light on all the figures is coming from somewhere over here. It's, it's like almost like Christ himself, who's up there in the corner there, is like he has an ice light. <laughs> so he's, he's casting light on all the, the, the entire cast of characters there. It's very, very sharp, very, very edgy light. Um, I like using chiaroscuro. Uh, Usually it's, well, I was going to say it's sunrise and sunset, but I'm never awake at sunrise. So for me, it's always sunset. But when the light is really, really low, you want to get a dark background. You want to get really, really directional light. Um, don't be afraid of the shadows and have fun with it. And it is, I hope I don't sound too terribly sexist here, but I find that uh, chiaroscuro is a little more appealing on men than it is on women. Women like a softer light. Uh, if you look at uh, Caravaggio, he almost never painted women. There are various reasons for that. But 
Um, uh, one of them, I think, is that women do not like that kind of light on them. It's, it's very unflattering. But for men, it denotes strength, right? This is an interesting shot. I shot this at a tango party. And the party was at uh, Riverside Church, uh, which is a great church. I've done weddings there. Um, and uh, this was in a little side chapel. And the light is from a, a floor lamp. You know those floor lamps that come up and go out like this, and they, they light up the ceiling, and, right? So they have this old falling apart floor lamp and that was lighting this little back chapel. And so I took the floor lamp, and I took a chair, and I laid the floor lamp on the chair so it was going up at an angle, and that's what's lighting him. Sometimes you really got to improvise, right? That's sort of halfway between uh, you know, continuous light and ambient light. That's taking the ambient light and making it continuous light. Uh, so anyway, nice dramatic lighting, very uh, chiaroscuro, very Caravaggio in this case. It's not that I never do it with women. Uh, this is a burlesque performer that I, I took a picture of. Um, it's very funny. I, I, I occasionally shoot burlesque shows. Uh, and, um, you know, the girls love me because I'm all about their outfits. <laughs> I was like, I'm always disappointed when they take their clothes off. It's, I'm, the, I'm the guy in the back screaming, put it back on. I like that dress. Uh, so, so they get to pose in these uh, positions with their outfits. Um, this was actually lit by um, two um, video lights. There was a videographer there, and she had two cheap little $20. She got them on eBay. I don't know where. And they, they, it was really good directional light. You know, I had two burlesque queens on either side. You have to picture this. So there are two like half-naked ladies on either side holding the lights. Uh, and she's posing for me, and it came out great. So I mean, you don't have to spend $500 for an ice light. You know, poke around, see what you can find. Um, but the video lights just don't have the, you can't dim them. They're not uh, gelable all that well, and they're, they're limited. But it's a good starting place. If you don't want to do the investment, you can probably find some stuff for $20, $30, $40 to play around with. And also, I find that uh, chiroscuro is really good for musculature. So if you've got somebody who's built, like David here, uh, using chiroscuro, using the harsh shadows. If you look at bodybuilding photos, a lot of them have this sort of approach. Really, really uh, bright light coming in from the side, harsh shadows, shows off every single muscle. Um, in this particular case, this was an interesting lighting setup. Uh, it's, this is daylight. Um, and uh, so it was in my studio, and I had light coming in this way through the door. I had a big door, and it was a very bright, sunny day. And I had a big reflector over to the side, and that light was reflecting into him. He was standing over in the corner behind, uh, in front of a black screen. So it, it was rather complicated, but it's all just reflected light coming back into him. Uh, so chiroscuro is also great for, for muscle boys, if you have the chance. All right, so now we're going to move on to Georges Latour, who is the master of candlelight. Anybody know him? A few people. Yeah, this is one of his more famous paintings. So I bet you can't tell what kind of light we're going to talk about now. Candlelight. Candlelight used to be hard, but now it's dead simple. Uh, because cameras are a lot more light sensitive. You can shoot at 6400. You can shoot at 12.8, for gosh sakes. Um, so it's basically you just use a light sensitive camera a light sensitive lens shooting at 2.8 or buy a 50 millimeter 1.8, they're like 100 bucks, you know. Uh, so shoot wide open, shoot at a high ISO. Uh, the key uh, is to meter to the face and not the flame. If you meter to the flame, everything will go black. Meter to the face, let the candlelight blow out, that's fine. You want to get the faces. So that's the only real major key as far as this goes. The best and cheapest way of doing this is to get a freaking candle. <laughs> it's like the cheapest light there is. So buy a candle. Uh, however, if you don't have a candle handy, uh, you can use a flashlight. Simple, easy. Just put your hand in front of it and pretend it's a candle. I, use, I actually keep a couple of flashlights with me all the time. You never know when they're going to come in handy. Um, so. Candlelight is generally under light. People hold candles down here naturally. Under light is monster light. We don't want monster light. 
or maybe you do want monster light, but in case you don't want monster light, just have your subject move the candle out and up, have them lower their chin a little bit, and you'll get a much better light. This particular situation, he's not holding a candle, he's holding an LED. So you really can get away with this with an LED if, if you don't have candles handy. Uh, candle lights, is, it's a cool way of, you know, I did a whole wedding uh, ceremony once that was completely lit by candles. But that was like eight or nine years ago before, you know, cameras could shoot that way. So it was, oh my God, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I had to get like a special camera and a special lens. Now it's easy. Excuse me. So finally, we're going to move on to my favorite portrait painter, John Singer Sargent. People know John Singer Sargent? Anybody see that fabulous John Singer Sargent show at the Met? Uh, to die. Amazing. So I grew up in Boston, or the Boston area. John Singer Sargent is a big influence in that area. The, Metro, uh, the Boston Museum of Art and the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum have a lot of sergeants. Uh, I come from a family of museum goers. So we, I've been um, looking at sergeant paintings since I was like this tall. I've, I just adore sergeant. But uh, the thing about Sargent, you know, I kept trying to figure, I wanted to figure out how to fit Sargent into this presentation because, uh, and I kept thinking, well, what is his, you know, general lighting scheme? What's his, you know, what does he return to over and over? He doesn't return to anything over and over. He actually has obviously studied all of the masters. You see Rembrandt in this lighting, right? You see Vermeer in this lighting. You see Caravaggio in this lighting, right? Bright light coming in from the side, very theatrical. Impressionism on plein air. George de la Tour, under lighting, candle lighting. This is at the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. This, this painting is so enormous that what you're seeing on the screen is about a quarter the size of the actual painting. It just takes up, it's massive. I love this painting. I can stare at this painting forever. But that would bore you, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> uh, this one is reminiscent of Edward Hopper, which is interesting because Edward Hopper was two years old when it was painted. Uh, but uh, maybe Edward Hopper was doing Sargent light rather than the other way around. So the thing about Sargent, uh, this is Madame X, arguably John Singer Sargent's most famous painting. You all know Madame X, right? Yeah. yeah. It's at the Met here in New York. This painting doesn't really fit any of the artists that we've discussed. Um, in fact, Sargent's doing something here that I'm not even sure, you know, I've never seen before. I'm not even sure how he accomplished it. The, the, it's hard to even put a label on it. The best I could say is it's like instead of edge light, it's an edge shadow. If, if you look on the, the left-hand side, arm and neck, is there's this dark shadow running up, which separates it from the darker background. I don't even know if you could do that in real light. I mean, I'm going to have to really experiment to try to figure that one out. The thing about Sargent is he took from everybody. And that's what I'm trying to get across from you guys. You guys practice all these different lighting sources. But I don't want you to think of it as recipes. All right, You should be doing what Sargent did. You should be. Uh, absorbing it and letting it filter through your own aesthetic and create something that is uniquely your own. Now this shot, now I'm not going, again, I'm not comparing myself to John Singer Sargent because that would be crazy. <laughs> I am so not John Singer Sargent, but I aspire to the same approach of using all these different influences. So this guy, I took his portrait, this is an outdoor and open shade like Seurat. And I saw this guy walking with his girlfriend. And I thought he had a great face, so I asked him to pose for me. Uh, I put him in front of a blue ad. So that's where I got the blue background. This was just a, an ad plastered on a wall. Uh, the light was really muted, so I threw in an ice light on the side to give it a little bit of edge, like you would see in Norman Rockwell. Um, there's a little bit of Rembrandt in there in the lighting. There's a little bit of Caravaggio in the posing. Uh, when I saw him, he had nothing on his head. Uh, and that fur hat was as actually his girlfriend's muff. <laughs> she was standing with keeping her hands warm. And I said, can I borrow that for a second? It's like, 
And all of a sudden, he turned into like a, a Russian czar before my eyes. You know, it was really cool. So I love this shot because so many weird things came together to make it happen. Now, if you had watched me take this picture, you would have thought it took 10 seconds for me to take the picture. And that is technically true. But a more accurate statement is that it took me 10 years to learn how to take this picture in 10 seconds. So the point here is to keep going out and shooting, and shoot, and shoot, and shoot, and shoot. Try things, fail, try again, and keep shooting. Go out and take pictures. Learn from all the painters. Nothing beats seeing these works in person, so get thee to a museum. You know, the Met, by the way, is a pay-what-you-want museum. They don't let people know that. Mm -hmm. But you can give them, like, 50 cents, and they'll let you in. Learn from your fellow photographers. Light is our greatest gift. So learn how to see light. Notice where it's coming from. Use ambient light. Give yourself an assignment to go out and take ambient light portraits. You need to do that to learn how to see the light. And once you can see the light with ambient light, you can start adding in continuous light. But you'll be much more attuned to how to use the continuous light if you would spend some time grounding yourself in ambient, right? So learn how to use the window light. You learn to see how light bounces around, right? See it. Learn to see it. Learn how to see it. Does anybody ever see this girl? She performs in the park. With, with, she's great. She's really cool looking. Again, this is just like coming in from the side of a tunnel. Learn how to use it. This is two different ice lights at the same time coming from opposite directions. So learn how to use the light. Learn how to see the light. Make your own masterpiece. And as they say, that's a wrap. So thank you all very, very much. This is my first time here. You made it wonderful. I appreciate it. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.